great to really be with you. And <clears throat> I just want to, because I know time is of the essence in, in many ways, I want to uh, make sure I stick to the point. Um, and the reason I've chosen preeminence of Christ this morning, and thank you for the invitation, by the way, and thank you. It's lovely to be part of your family and part of what God is doing with you. Linda and I love the fact that we can work and partner with you in ministry. It's a real joy for us. James and Bruce, so thank you and your church. Um, very dear friends, and we value that today more than ever before. Amen. And um, yeah, just to, you know, I, I do believe as I read in the media and I look at social media and many things that are going on in, um, you know, that's coming across our TV, particularly internationally and locally, is that there's a real attack upon uh, the, upon Jesus Christ, the Antichrist spirit in the world is rising up, and I really believe the world is doing its best to eliminate anything to do with Jesus Christ. And so, <clears throat> I want us to be reminded this morning just how important it is for us, the church, to recognize what Christ is doing within us right now and what He's saying to us. So my first initial start of the meeting is just to introduce to us again a fresh um, view of the preeminence of Jesus Christ as Lord of the church. So, you know, there's a real fight for the truth today. I really believe there's a heavenly fight. It's about the truth as to who Jesus is to us and to the world. And the integrity of Jesus is under attack. You know, as the Son of God, the resurrected Son, his resurrection power, his word, his true humanity, Jesus, the way of life, the way to heaven, the deity of Christ is under attack, folks. And we need to know this very, very important strategy of the enemy. You know, did God say, is my question to us, did God really say? And he did that with Adam and Eve, and he did that with Jesus when he was in the desert. But, you know, if you look at the book of Colossians, Paul highlights to the church in, you know, and to the people of Colossians, to the brethren, he says this in one, in the first of, uh, chapter, verse 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's my prayer for us today, that we will be pleasing to our heavenly father. You know, the Father's comment to Jesus, this is my beloved Son in who I am well pleased. So that's my heart for us, that we will please the Father in all that we do. So, you know, if you look at um, Colossians, and maybe you want to do a study of the book, but the first chapter really describes something very, very powerful, uh, expressing the God's desire throughout the ages, the priority of God in the ages, yeah, thank you, James, for that. That whole, um, you know, slide demonstrates for a little bit of study in the book of Colossians who Christ is. And it really speaks about those areas of the, the universal government of God, the reconciliation, the word, and the word of um, knowledge, or wisdom and knowledge, personal observation, and, you know, living in Christ or living as, as Christians today. So let me just move on with this. You know, in all things, Christ is the preeminent one, is what scripture says. And preeminence really means superiority of power and influence, notably above all others, sup, you know, superiority in excellence. You know, Jesus did everything with excellence, a distinction above all others in quality, rank, and he holds first place. You know, it's just an amazing when you look at what scripture says about Jesus. And yet today, even in the church, we don't acknowledge sometimes, and I'm not talking about faith point now, I'm talking about the church by and large in, you know, nationally, we don't really give God the full glory that's due to his name. So Paul goes on in verse 15 of the first book of Colossians. He says, Christ, the image of the invisible God, very powerful, Christ, the, you know, the image of God. And then he goes on and he, uh, he says uh, in the Amplified um, Bible, I love it, adds a little bit more to it. It says, 
he is the exact likeness of the unseen God. In other words, he's the visible res representation of the invisible. And sometimes we want to see in the invisible realm. But let me say to you, just look to Jesus and we will have a good picture of who he is and what the word says about him. In the New Living Translation, which I have got a copy of as well, I love that. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. And the word image that's reflected in scripture is a word ekron. It, in, the English word is icon. Jesus is the image of our God. The likeness and representation or the picture of who God is. So we need to see that when we worship the Lord, when we honor him. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Jesus, the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. And I love that about the Lord. Express image speaks about the character of God. That means in many ways we are, there's an expression of God in us and through us, which which is a very powerful uh, thing that goes on in, in um, what we're doing. And, and I want to just, you know, encourage you that the word engrave and impress speaks about the original impression of God is through Christ Jesus, the perfect imprint of the very image of God, the nature of God, upholding, maintaining and guiding and propelling the universe in his mighty works of power. That's who God is. It's an incredible picture for you and I to understand about the Lord. It speaks a lot about the character of God, the character of Christ. And I believe today the church, um, God is speaking to the church in many ways to reflect the character of Christ. And there's a characteristic of the Holy Spirit working in us to speak about the holiness of God again. And, you know, if we look at character, it says it's the inherent composite of qualities that determines a person's moral and ethical actions and reactions. That's the picture that Jesus came to give the church about the character of Christ. So I want to say to you today that it's important for us to demonstrate the nature of God through the church. And when Jesus spoke about the perfection and the nature of God. He spoke a little bit about that in John 5, 19, 22, 23, those sort of scriptures. It says, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do, for whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. There's a clue for us. Whatever we do needs to be in like manner, the father and the son working in us. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all who should honor the Son, just as they honor the Father, he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Very powerful scriptures. So, you know, many of these truths are reiterated in the slide that I've given. So I want to um, just move on to the first part of it and just touch for the church this morning, some of the keys that I believe help us in our presentation. And I'm still really going to go through slide one, if you don't mind, James. I just want to really say this, the invisible image of God, you know, often in vision and in dreams, we get an impression of who God is. But we've got to remember in verse 15, it says this, the, he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of a creation. That means God has given him preeminence over creation, over the church, over everything. He has an exalted position in the church, an exalted position in our lives. The word image is an exact revelation and representation of the heart of the Father. And I believe today the church is experiencing the heart of the Father through Christ Jesus. The turning of the sons of the hearts of the fathers to the sons and then the sons back to the father. That's why I believe there's a cry today for this generation to find God and our sons and our daughters to come back. So that's why there's such an emphasis on the harvest 
and we will see that continue in these times. Um, the second point there is the agent of creation. All things were created through him and for him. If we remember that, we'll, we'll, we'll you know and understand the authority that God has got in Christ. The authority over cosmic powers, doesn't matter what the enemy is doing, we've got to know that Jesus rules and reigns in the universe today. And anything that's happening is by the express permission of God. So this coronavirus, God knows all about it, when it's going to end, how it's going to turn out for us. And in some ways, it's God getting our eyes off things of the world. You know, everything that could be closed down is being closed down our sports stadiums, um, our economies, our cinemas, our places of, you know, of focus in fashion and concerts and superstars. Jesus is our superstar. And God's saying to us, I want you to get your eyes off the world and on, back onto Jesus. He's the sustainer. And, you know, it says in that scripture, and he is before all things, and in him consist. All in him, all things consist. That means he holds everything together in your life, in my life. Christ is the sustainer of every godly principle in the world. And he is reiterating that over and over as head of the church. The next point, he is the head of the body. If we recognize we the body under his control, the church is going to move into the inheritance of the firstborn. And I believe that, you know, what God is doing in Christ is focusing us back on Jesus as the head. And as we listen to the commandment of the head or the commands of the head again, and he says, rise up church, declare who I am, worship me in spirit and in truth. We're going to see some incredible things take place in the church in these days. And I believe this is a pre, a, a pre, a reset <laughs> or preset time, you know, time that God is working in us, showing us his supremacy over all things, including the church. And when you look at that scripture, I noticed there were a couple of things that I want to remind us of today as to what they are. And it's important for us to just see those so that I can just quickly remind us. He's the image and the likeness of the manifestation of the invisible God through the Holy Spirit. That's his supremacy. That means as the firstborn, he is sovereign over all creation. He's the creator. In other words, the architect, the builder, and his goals in the universe will be fulfilled. He's the sustainer and the head of all in the church. He's the firstborn from the dead the preeminent one. Moving to slide two, I just want to say something to you that really shook me in a way. It says, he pleases the Father. Let me say to you today, there are many things we can do that will be loved by the Father continuously, but do we please the Father in what we're doing? And Jesus pleased the Father by his obedience and I think that's a key for us today. Let's do and be obedient to what the Father's saying to us. It says, having made peace through the blood of Jesus. It's a very key scripture. Blood satisfies the holiness of Christ shed on the cross to satisfy the demand of God for holiness. He established peace through the covenant that we live in today. So the peace of God should, that surpasses all knowledge should govern our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The second point there is he reconciles us through his death. Let me say to you, the church is called, I believe, to a ministry of reconciliation, to re reconcile man back to God. And I see that ministry growing in the church, that we are going to minister powerfully in and through the blood of Jesus to reconcile man back to God to restore the harmony in the fellowship that God first created. Lives in us as a hope of glory. What a powerful, one of my current prayers and, you know, regular prayers is Christ in me, the hope of glory. Christ lives in you and me. 
And we're, this is not head knowledge. This is heart knowledge. And God wants the church to have true faith, to believe that he responds to us as he lives in us. The hope of his glory in context is that, you know, God through Christ forms his perfect character and nature in us. We have a hope, but our hope is always in Christ. Our dependence is on him who dwells in us, the Lord Almighty. I think it's still beyond our imagination and our thoughts to know that a holy God dwells within us. So when we face challenges, we face them in Christ, and he is adequate, more than adequate, to help us resolve those. Moving to slide three, wisdom and knowledge. I believe that more than ever before, the Lord is you know, giving us some very clear indications what he wants to do with us. Being, knit and being knitted together in love is what that uh, treasure, that scripture in two verse, uh, Colossians 2 verse 2 and 3 speaks about. You know, I'm more and more convinced that the Lord is knitting us together. I know that God is a knitter and he knits us in relationship with him, but also with one another. So that the hidden treasures of wisdom and knowledge can be expressed through the church, through us, because we are in unity, believing God for great things. Now, that is happening throughout the world as we look together. Why? Because when the early church prayed together in one accord, the Holy Spirit came down. I think it's going to be no different for us as the body unites together in these end times. And then Paul says, not worldly philosophy. Let me say to you, philosophies of the world are being you know, broadcast in every medium today. Why? Because the enemy knows his time is short. Worldly philosophies and relig religious traditions will keep us from understanding who Christ is. Don't let the enemy cheat us. The word cheat in that scripture in 2 verse 8 speaks about plunder or take captive our lives. The enemy cannot plunder your life or my life. Moving on in uh, personal observation, um, we are alive in him. Uh, just really want to come back to this. I, I love what it means in the scripture that, you know, as we pray to the Lord for wisdom and counsel, the Lord speaks through his spirit to us and he gives us um, strength and power to know the wisdom and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Very powerful thing to understand what God is doing. In verse 16 to 23, I'm just going to touch on one thing. The substance, our substance comes in Christ. Very powerful thing uh, to understand that God wants us to know that, you know, our faith is the substance of things hoped for. That means everything we do is in Christ. Our substance is of him and in him. Why? Because the enemy will cheat us of our reward if we don't take notice of that. So I'm going to move on um, and to go to point five because I don't want to go over my time this morning. I'm very conscious of that. Um, and I'm really going to encourage you to spend time on this and let it sink into your heart. Do a bit of homework. In, in chapter in my point five, living Christian living or living in Christ, he is our life. We are hidden with Christ in God. And I love that because it speaks about being inseparable from God in Christ because he's redeemed us to commune with him, to walk with him and to stay with him. It's a foretaste of our heavenly delights that are coming. We are united with Christ we live in, in him. Ephesians 2.6 says, God raised, up, raised us up. In other words, we have been raised up with Christ, seated with him in heavenly realms. That means there's a place of security and love and grace because we are seated with him. And then we need to avoid immorality and bless others. Uh, let me just add to this that, you know, Beware that no one cheats you. But in that scripture, I want you to just notice something when you have a look at it. Paul speaks a lot about putting off the old man. I love this because 
It's very descriptive words that he uses. Now, put off anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Take those things off. In other words, take off the old man with his deeds. He gives us the instruction. But then he says, now put on the new man. I love that. Put on the new man. Be renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created us. Put on the Lord Jesus this morning. Christ is all and in all. So what he's referring to is the character of the new man. Coming back to what I said early, earlier, it says, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on, this is what I want us to put on this morning, tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Then Paul finishes off and says this, but above all things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. So my prayer in closing for us this morning is cast away all things that don't belong to the Lord or to anything of self-indulgence, attitude, speech, prejudice of mind. Uh, and this morning, I want you to put on Christ Jesus. So I thank you for this in, in my opportunity to share with you this morning. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Len. Um, you've done very, very well to get a snapshot of the book of Colossians there. Um, just let me just uh, have a bit of a chat with you, Len, while we're all focused here. Um, I noticed that with a lot of the content that you are sharing with us today, uh, the focus has been on the nature and the character of Christ. Uh, do you think uh, with this, uh, this current global di dilemma that some of, the, some of the things that we're seeing in terms of what the reset means for us, because I guess my thought on this has simply been is that um, the way that the church has been operating has simply stopped. Mm. It's, it's come to a grinding halt. Um, and none of us could really foresee to the extent of how this has happened because it's, it's a global halt. Mm. Um, so I guess when God stops something, um, we've got to analyze why has he done this? And uh, when we restart, what are some of the things that we, that we see that should be different? Yes. So my question, Len, is, is that uh, with the reset, what, what are you seeing God do um, across the global church? What are some of the things that you feel that he's saying to the church of Jesus right now? You know, that's a good question. Um, I do, I want to go back to something that I saw very vividly uh, when I was in a meeting about three years ago. And uh, it was, I had gone there to share in the city at one of the churches and they called the leaders together and they asked me to share. But as I got up to share, I felt the Lord say to me, now I want you to speak about, um, about our responsibility to communicate back to the Lord in what he's called us to do. And I you know, understood something there very clearly that God was saying, my house is a house of prayer. And then I felt the Lord say to me out of uh, you know, 2 uh, Chronicles 7, verse 13, 14, and 15, he said, even though there's pestilence in the land, you know, and the locusts have come to devour the crops, he said, if my people will humble themselves and pray, um, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. You see, I, I saw sort of, uh, a number of things there, even though there's pestilence like there is today, uh, like there's locusts devouring parts of, of nations like Kenya, um, Ethiopia, the, the um, size of the locusts swarms are so big, they bigger than the, the size of the city of New York. In 30 minutes, they can devour every living thing on the face of the earth in a nation. In 30 minutes, there's so many of them. And I've got a story from a pastor friend in uh, Ethiopia that they've just gone through that. And he said, it's too frightening for words to see that happen. And, you know, then 
But coming back to the scripture, I really believe that there's a covenant relationship that God calls us to, that in some ways we've ignored, and that's to bow, go down, you humble yourself. Why does God say that? I believe is because we've had too much pride, pride of self. We can do this thing, God. We'll build your church. We don't need you to build it. We can build it. You know, humble yourself, pray. You know, really earnest prayer. It means daily prayer. Seek my face. It means get our, thing, our eyes off hands. God, give us. Give us this. Give us that. Give us the nations. Jesus said, I am the giver of nations. You know, I, I am the Lord of nations. I'll give the nations to you, but come, come through me. Turn from your wicked ways. In other words, pride, uh, self-indulgence. Um, you know, we can build this thing, Lord, we'll build the Tower of Babel. Don't tell us how to do it. And then God says, I will forgive your sins. I will hear your prayers. And he said, I will heal your land. Those are the exact things that we need today. And then in verse 15, he says, the promise then is my ears will be open and my eyes will be attentive to the prayers made in this place. I really, you know, in a way, my heart sense that God is bringing us back to that very place uh, where the church prays. So it's not like we're not praying. I've seen prayer increase, but I do think that, you know, God wants us to turn the tide of evil in the world today. We need to pray. And I believe that's our secret. That's our weapon. That's our power. That's all in God. Amen. I guess, um, I guess part of that is, you know, every Christian inherently knows that uh, we're called to pray. Uh, mm. The disciples, the early disciples, they, um, they were aware of their shortfallings. And when they watched Jesus, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. You know, they saw that he had something that, that, that was um, vacant and missing from their own life. So I wonder if it's, it's not even just so much a call to pray, but a, a call to a greater connection uh, with Christ. As um, you know, I remember a couple of years ago, I was in my daily devotions and the Lord said to me, uh, stop skimping on, on the word. Stop skimping on the word. And I, I knew exactly what God was saying. He was saying, you know, you're just not giving the right attention and the right amount of time uh, to the word. It was like, uh, you know, word light. Uh, yes. and, and he wants the church to go deeper and to find that connection. I can't help but think, you know, when Jesus challenged um, the money changers in the temple mm. who had uh, turned the objective of the temple, which was my father's house shall be called a house of prayer. You've yeah. made it a den of thieves that, mm. that a lot of other um, activities had entered the daily life of God's people. And that made it everything about what it shouldn't be about. Yes. And Jesus turned the tables of the money changes over. It was a, it was a display of huge emotion mm. by the son of God. And yeah. I'm sure there would have been many, many people quite surprised at the, mm. at the gravity of the way that Jesus dealt with the situation at the time. Mm. And I guess what I'm a little bit afraid of is that if we don't get this reset now, mm. um, we're going to move out of this and, and, and the money changers, so to speak, are going to go back and reset their tables and carry on mm. with business as usual. Very good point, James. Very good. Yeah, I, th I think that's, um, you know, that money changing, I think, is that if we look at the world economy today, we have had our eyes on finances, money, the, the mammon. And, and I think you're absolutely right. That's what our eyes have been on. God shut down our economies. And I think many things will change in the economy going forward. And God's going to teach the church, you and I, um, and everyone involved, how to keep our eyes on him for the future. And I think this is going to be a challenge because following on from where the church is today and the resetting that's taking place in financial finances of the world, in ability to exchange money and to, um, you know, buy and sell, you know, you can be reassured that a, 
a system is going to be put in place that's going to make it more difficult for us as the church and believers to interact in the financial ways. And I think that this is a preset reset of, you know, control in the world today. Right. How do you control a nation? I mean, and we've all just been controlled on what to do and how to do it over the last three weeks. And uh, it shows you how easy it can happen. The next thing is, you know, if you want to go into the supermarket and buy some money, well, he has a card or he has something, you know, to, uh, you know, that you can exchange with. So, you know, I think we are moving very quickly into a controlled society today. And that's why God wants the church. I think your earlier view about us really being connected with God and with one another is where the strength is going to lie. Innovation will come out of the body of Christ and how to live and do life together again. Yes. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I, I, I feel that more than ever before that if we don't pick up on the reset of what Christ is speaking to us, it's not about, it's not necessarily, you know, many people think that cont being contemporary, a contemporary church is about being relevant mm. uh, and that we're relevant by the way we dress. We're relevant by the aesthetics of the meetings that we attend and the way that we dress our buildings up, but real relevance comes from who we are in Christ yes. and what emanates out of our life yes. as followers of Jesus Christ. And I feel that's where the deep reset needs to take place in all of our lives. Um, you know, we're not being, we're not, we won't, we won't come to the point of being force fed of mm -hmm. having things forced down our throat, but we'll be hungry desirous for God's food for heavenly manner and mm. to and to see you know uh, a church emerge that is uh you know purified desirous of God's agenda uh, yes. within the life of the church is there anything else that you're seeing right now Len or that you feel that that God is saying to 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 us or maybe even as a church right now yeah. Well, you know, I do really believe, James, that, um, you know, just listening to you talk, um, you know, you're talking from an apostolic um, viewpoint about where the church is today. And I think that's what's going to make the difference uh, for the church. Uh, we've had, you know, a lot of pastoral care and um, over many years, but God is now shifting the church to become an apostolic people, people sent of God but they have to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And I, I really want to say that to you as Faith Point, well done for focusing on making strong believers um, in your church. The equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry has been your focus.